In this video, we'll look at Lewis structures and exceptions to the octet rule. Previously, we saw that elements want to follow the octet rule when they form a Lewis structure. Now we're going to look at some exceptions to that. There's three types of exceptions. First, if our ion or molecule has an odd number of electrons. Second, if our ion or molecule has less than an octet. And finally, if the ion and molecule ends up with more than an octet. So it ends up with more than eight valence electrons around it. This is also called an expanded octet. Looking at the first example with the odd numbers, this is a relatively rare and quite unusual, quite unstable reactive substances. These are ions or molecules with an odd number of electrons. If we look at our example of nitrogen monoxide, NO. NO, nitrogen we know has five valence electrons. Oxygen has six. That gives us 11 valence electrons total. So once you do that and you draw its Lewis structures, you can end up with either the first structure here or the second structure. And we can see on the first structure, nitrogen has seven valence electrons around it. Oxygen has eight valence electrons. Because remember the line here, each line represents two electrons. So each line represents two dots. There. So you can see each line represents two dots. So they'd be sharing four electrons in between them. Alternatively, we draw where nitrogen has eight electrons and oxygen has seven electrons. So now which structure is the better structure? They both are technically correct. We filled up all the electrons we could. We've drawn 11 valence electrons total, but which one is correct? For that, we have to use formal charge. So if you remember with our formal charges, that's going to equal the number of valence electrons minus our lines or a number of bonds minus our dots or a number of lone or the lone pair electrons. So remember lines are our bonds and these are the lone pair electrons. So if I look at nitrogen, nitrogen can have five valence electrons. So if I have five valence electrons and I see I drew two lines, so minus two, and then I have one, two, three dots minus three, gives me a zero count for the formal charge on nitrogen. And then if I look at oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons, minus two lines, minus one, two, three, four dots. So that gives me a zero formal charge. Yay, they're both zero formal charges. This is a pretty happy configuration. Now we go to our second structure, do the exact same thing. Nitrogen, five valence electrons, minus two lines, minus four dots, one, two, three, four. Five minus two minus four gives me a minus one. And now we look at oxygen. Oxygen, six valence electrons, minus two lines, one, two, minus three dots, one, two, three. That gives me a formal charge of plus one. Since this structure has more formal charges on it, that makes it the less favorable structure. So that means structure one This is our favorable structure. And then structure two is less favorable. So that means more often than not, our nitrogen will have just seven electrons around it and oxygen will have eight, which also makes sense if we think about the electronegativity. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. Since oxygen is more electronegative, it's going to want that electron more than the nitrogen does. 
So that's one reason why this is our more stable configuration. Now looking at our second type of exception, we want to look at when we end up with structures that have fewer than eight electrons. Looking at BF3, boron trifluoride. If we draw the Lewis structure for boron trifluoride, we can end up with any one of these four. And if we give boron an octet, such as the second, third, and fourth structure here, that will actually end up putting a formal charge on our fluorine and our boron. And we can look at this by looking at the formal charge. If we look at the boron here, or the boron for any one of these three structures, that boron, since it's in column three, has three valence electrons, minus one, two, three, four lines, so minus four bonds, minus zero lone pairs. So that gives me a formal charge of negative one for the boron. And now let's look at the double bonded fluorine. So we can see there's one fluorine that has a double bond in each of the structures. So fluorine, DB double bond. Fluorine, since it's a halogen, has seven valence electrons. And now when I look at the double bonded one, I have two lines to it. So each of them you can see has two lines. And then we look at the number of lone pair electrons, the number of dots, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So each fluorine that's double bonded has four dots around it. So it has four electrons in its lone pairs. So seven minus two minus four gives me a plus one. So the fluorine actually ends up with a formal charge of plus one and the boron has a formal charge of minus one. So now let's look at our exception here, the one that I've labeled dominant. That boron is in column three. So three valence electrons minus three lines, one, two, three no lone pairs. So that's going to give a formal charge of zero. Now looking at the fluorines, each fluorine is single bonded. So we're going to call it single bond fluorine to give it a distinction from our double bond one we just did. Each single bond fluorine, seven valence electrons, one line, so one bond, minus one, two, three, four, five, six dots. So minus three lone pairs gives me minus six electrons. So seven minus one minus six gives a formal charge of zero. So every single bonded fluorine has a formal charge of zero. So you can see on the dominant form, everything has a formal charge of zero. On the less important ones, the non-dominant ones, we can see the boron always has a formal charge of negative one, and one of the fluorines always has a formal charge of plus one. Since there's more formal charges on these structures, that's why they're less important. Remember, we always want the structure that has the lowest number of formal charges. And so looking at this, sometimes if we fill the octet of the central atom, that's gonna result in a negative charge on that central atom and a positive charge or positive formal charge on the more electronegative outer atom. If that happens, then it's best not to fill the octet of the central atom. Because remember, fluorines are more electronegative element. It's gonna want the electron more, which means it's not gonna want half a formal charge of plus one. This says there's some electron deficiency on the fluorine. Fluorine does not like to have electron deficiency. It likes to have an excess of electrons, if anything. And now looking at our final exception to the octet rule, the expanded octet. So this is when we have more than eight electrons around an atom. So for example, PF5, phosphorus tetrafluoride, it can exist only if phosphorus has 10 electrons around it. 
that's more than an octet. So when we do the expanded octet, that's when you have to be in row three or below. This is important, row three. What happens in the n equals three level? So if we remember n equals one, that only gives us s orbitals. n equals two, that gives us s and p. That's where we get our eight electrons. n equals three, we get s, p, and d orbitals. d orbitals are where we start. That's where we can put the extra electrons. That's where we can expand the octet is using d orbitals. Because remember, s orbitals, two electrons max. s and p, eight electrons max. s, p, and d, hey, now we're talking. I can technically put 18 electrons between these three subshells. 10 electrons in the D, six in the P, two in the S. So since we had that D orbital now, I can expand the octet. I can add more electrons around it. That's how we can end up with phosphorus pentafluoride is if I can put electrons into the D orbital and start using the D orbital, I can end up with this expanded octet. So and then also sometimes we can draw a loose structure using a phosphorus. And if it only has eight electrons, that may not be the best structure after all. Because if I draw my phosphate ion, PO4 minus three, I can draw a loose structure like the first one here. Each oxygen ends up with a negative one formal charge and the phosphorus ends up with a positive one. And we can double check that really quick. Phosphorus, it's in row five or it's in column five. I've drawn four bonds to it. No lone pairs equals a plus one. Oxygen, it's in column six. I've drawn one bond and six lone pairs gives me a negative one. So you can see everything ends up with a formal charge. But if I expand the octet of phosphorus just once, I can change it and I can get a slightly more stable configuration. So for this P, for this phosphate ion, phosphorus actually ends up with a formal charge of zero. So we can double check that phosphorus, again, five. Now I've drawn five lines to it. So five minus five minus zero gives me zero. Yay. Oxygen here. So we can call it the double bonded oxygen is column six minus two bonds minus four dots. Hey, that gets zero. I've now decreased the number of formal charges in my structure. And so by decreasing the number of formal charges in my structure, I've created a slightly more stable structure here. Now you may be asking, why can't we draw something where all of the oxygens are double bonded so that all their formal charges are zero? Then phosphorus's formal charge would be too high. We always wanna get as close to zero as possible. If we need to have something with negative charge on it, should be on the more electronegative element. So remember, we can do this expanded octet, anything row three or below. So anything phosphorus, so you can think phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, selenium, bromine, iodine. The rest we're starting to get into the metalloids but all of these can expand their octet and have more than eight electrons around it. So now we know how to draw Lewis structures for an octet, Lewis structures for odd number of electrons, Lewis structures for atoms where we don't want an octet, so less than an octet, and Lewis structures for expanded octets. Couple tips. Remember, keep track of your valence electrons. If you don't keep track of the valence electrons, you're more likely to make a mistake when you draw your Lewis structures.
And then second, a tip, when you have a molecular formula, we generally write the central atom first, if you've noticed, as long as it's not the hydrogen. So H2PO4, not quite. PO4, phosphorus is the central one. CH3OH, carbon is the central one. So you can kind of see the central one usually goes first. Most of the time, oxygen is not a central atom. Hydrogen is never a central atom. Most of the time, oxygen is not. It's just too electronegative. Always draw your bonds first, then add your lone pairs. And then check for octets. Always check for octets. If you need to, make a double bond or triple bond from lone pairs if you can't make the octet on the central atom. And then always check your formal charges after you do this. That's our last point. Check the formal charge. That can tell you if you drew the best Lewis structure or not.